Good morning, Michael. Good morning. Good morning. Mike and I have known each other a long time. Uh, we're really good colleagues, uh, and he's a surgeon as I am. Mike's an associate professor of surgery at UCSF. We have some common interests, <laughs> exactly. you know, and in, uh, interoperative radiation therapy and DCIS and right. fun things like that. We're all here in San Antonio with a bunch of your colleagues from a wonderful uh, the breast center that you've got at UCSF. Well, thank you. So Mike, tell me, I think you're making a presentation here. As, as you know, this is the largest breast research meeting in the world. Tell our physician colleagues about your presentation. Well, we, we're having a presentation uh, tomorrow on the cost effectiveness of the new DCIS score that Genomic Health has developed. Okay. Uh, we're very interested in uh, the societal perspective of how healthcare is handled, not just on the patient basis, but also as a whole with regards to the cost of providing care. Okay, very good. Now, I, is your talk embargoed in any way that you know? Uh, no, I think we can we can discuss well, it. Let's do that <laughs> for the people who are out there. So that sure. let's give them because I get a list each day of the embargoed information, I, and I don't think I saw yours on that list. So yeah. I think it's okay because yeah, sure. these people aren't here; right. they're out there, <laughs> and they want to know all about what you're doing. Well, yeah, sure. I think um, you know, a little over um, basically a year ago, this meeting, Genomic Health came out with their new DCIS score. Right. So basically, a way to objectively identify prognostic risk uh, for recurrence after lumpectomy for DCIS. Yep. Now, as you know, in this country, upwards of 75 or 80 percent, or even more, of women that have lumpectomy for DCIS also have radiation. Right. And there's a significant aspect with radiation, especially for the patient, the yep. inconvenience, the yep. time commitment, yep. and such. But also, there's a cost, not just uh, monetarily, but also quality of life. Absolutely. So we decided to model, utilizing the new score, how it would affect the quality of life for these women, as well as the cost of providing care for patients with DCIS. So we were, we were able to take the actual validation group that was utilized for the for the DCIS score, and we modeled it into two arms basically. Okay. One arm would be a strategy where typically almost 75% of women would get radiation after lumpectomy. Okay. And we looked at the quality of life for that model group, the cost of giving the radiation, the surgery, and all of the outcomes that are associated sure. with that. Sure. The other arm was a strategy where each woman with DCIS would have the DCIS score run. Okay. And then from that data, you would identify a very low risk of recurrence, okay. and we could offer those women lumpectomy alone. Okay. So now we have two models where about 75% of women are getting radiation, and the other arm where only about 25% are getting okay. radiation. And, and Mike, we're used to certain characteristics about DCIS and making decisions. It's right. like we do in everything else, particularly in invasive cancer, and the Oncotype DX is really helped us begin to sort of differentiate those. What, uh, what are you finding in, in DCIS? I mean, I typically think of high-grade DCISs. I worry a lot about those patients versus lower intermediate grade DCIS. Do you see much correlation with the Oncotype score based on grade yeah, no, of, of in situ breast cancer? That's a, that's a great question. I think, as you, as you said, with the invasive Oncotype score at six years ago, we were all a little bit nervous about right. moving into the molecular uh, assay business and, right. and such. And we came to find that the biology is much better described by these assays than the Absol true phenotypical Absolutely. grade. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think with DCIS, they're finding the same thing. Now, yeah. it's interesting, if you look at the way we used to grade DCIS, uh, a lot of women were graded more low and intermediate. Correct. And with the new guidelines, a lot of women are now becoming what we would say is high grade. And so there has the been new guidelines thing. don't define the new guidelines. Right. I mean, from the oncotype test. No, you know? for the cap, the, the for the new cap. Right, All right. The pathology <clears throat> guidelines. Okay. Have moved into a slightly higher grade with okay. nuclear grading, and so what you find actually is that a significant number of women with a, with DCIS that's high grade can have either a low recurrence score by yeah. DCIS yeah. or a high recurrence score okay. by DCIS. So I think okay. it's it's really helped us identify and objectify this in a much better way. Okay, fantastic. And so tell us uh, more, more details about how, where you see this going, and are there any sort of projections on what the cost, I mean, yeah. the, the same, I mean, listen, you and I both know one of the values of the aquatype and invasive is you and I have yet to meet a patient who said, wow, can I have chemotherapy? <laughs> right. You know, right. and the same thing I think is true of, wow, can I have whole breast radiation therapy? Yeah. Yeah. 
you know. Uh, so tell me how the patients are reacting to this and some of the other outcomes from your study. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the, the hit it right on the head. The, you know, with the invasive, it was trying to avoid overtreatment with chemotherapy. Yep. With lumpectomy and DCIS, we feel very strongly that at least at, at our institution that people are getting overtreated with radiation. So how can we identify women that don't need that extra radiation potentially uh, and still be treated effectively with, with surgery? So, so we really uh, dived into this and identifying it in multiple aspects. I think you know, the classic way that we use this is that if a woman has a lumpectomy for DCIS, we run the DCIS score, and if it has a sufficiently low enough risk of recurrence without radiation, we talk to that women, the, those women, and we really have a joint meeting and let them buy into it and give them the information okay. so they can help make the shared decision. Now, I, and I won't tell Mel Silverstein what you said, <laughs> but our good friend Mel Silverstein and the Van Nuys criteria, uh, is Van Nuys going to be supplanted by the Oncotype test, do you think? Or, and, and then, uh, you probably haven't done this, and I'm really putting you on the spot, <laughs> but any chance you kind of informally looked at some of the Van Nuys or historic right. criteria and said, wow, this is really different now that we've got the recurrence work. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the difficulty with all tests, nomograms and such, is sure. a lot of time they're, they're not as effective as you would expect when you develop them from older, non, okay. real, you know, not good, good sets of data. Now, now right. Mel's done an unbelievable job, right. uh, and he, that was what we had at the time. That's right. Exactly. And I think now we've moved into to the next generation. And you know, we I think the, the the researchers at Genomic Health have looked at the validation study and looking at the Van Nuys score and realizing that the Van Nuys prognostic index didn't fare as well as the score does in their validation cohort. I think more people will look at that. Um, specifically at our institution, we've only had you know a handful of cases where we've com compared it. Got it. And as you would expect, the molecular assay tends to outdo the kind of classic yep. clinical pathologic yep. features that we've utilized in the past. So, so we're, we're, we're very happy with it. I think um, we really want to move to this era of stratifying women with DCIS more, at, more in the sense of what we do for prevention. So we have kind of a, a spectrum of, of risk. So we have women with atypia biopsies, <laughs> LCIS biopsies, DCIS. And now we can really look at those as kind of prevention for an invasive cancer in the future. Interesting you should bring that up because um, I was just sort of thumbing through the New England Journal article a few weeks ago saying that we're over-diagnosing breast cancer. Right. They, uh, the, it's a, I don't know about you, but I think it's a pretty controversial article. Sure, sure. Um, and, and so uh, clearly we're seeing, I think, at least in my setting, more women with DCIS. Okay. That's obviously... 99% of those are coming from screening, although the occasional DCIS can present as a palpable mass. Right. Sort of blend that in. Do you, I don't think we're over uh, diagnosing and over treating breast cancer. I think we're preventing things down downstream big time. And yet, when you look at the mathematic models that people are using, I don't I don't know what to make of that article. And so elaborate a little bit more with molecular profiling and how do you see that helping us? Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. It, it has been it, it has been a controversy and a question for at least the last five to seven years. Really looking at screening and what that's doing. Right. And you're absolutely right. There is a question that maybe we are identifying much more low grade, intermediate grade DCIS, uh, very small early stage breast cancers. And the ultimate question is. Would those become clinically apparent yeah. if they weren't? weren't and, 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 and Mike, for me, the question is, how do we determine that in the individual case? Exactly, right. You're Mrs. Smith sitting opposite right. me with a stereo core biopsy of intermediate grade DCIS. Yeah. Your yeah. eyes are dilated this big, and you've got breast cancer. And, and, and I might have said, well, you know, honey, that isn't going to do anything bad. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Right. And she said, well, thank you very much. I'll now find the next doctor. <laughs> no, it's know. a, it's a, no, it's a very good point, I think. Um, We've, we're moving from population-based discussions and decision-making to individualized you discussions, and, and, so, and I think this is you're, you're, you're absolutely right. So, so there's a question that you know we've identified a lot of DCIS, and we haven't really dropped significantly the rate of new invasive cancers. 
And so the question is, are we are we identifying these? And and so then the the question then, as you said, is, okay, so you've told me we're maybe identifying or over over diagnosing. Right. Which ones are the ones that are over diagnosed? Prospectively, that, exactly. So now right. there there are numerous groups that have been trying to look at if we take low grade DCIS and not give radiation, or if we do a core biopsy for low grade DCIS right. and not do a lumpectomy. But how can we objectively identify which patient would be best to move into that? All that right, uh, I want you to hold that thought because Todd Hartley is about ready to come back on here and just to make a quick announcement, I just saw him moving over there. Well, uh, one of the great things is you're free to jump into this conversation. Feel free to submit a question in at breastcanceranswers.com and I'll make sure it gets into the conversation if it's relevant. I also want to mention that um, we're going to be bringing you news as it's developing. Some things you're hearing right behind me, there's also news developing next door in the press room and we'll continue to do that throughout this week up until Friday afternoon bringing you the latest from the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. Thank you Dr. Hermes. You bet. Mike, do you envision a potential clinical trial based on what you were just talking about. In other words, stereotactic core, small area of microcalps, low oncotype recurrence score, do you envision that there may be a group of patients that will just simply follow? What I'm thinking about here is a lot of the same controversy that goes on in prostate cancer, right? You know, and the, the group that can be theoretically observed and see what happens. What do you project into the future for us? What do you think? No, oh, absolutely. So in the UK, for example, they were working on a low-risk DCIS trial, trying to identify that type of person that okay. could have a core biopsy okay. that could forego lumpectomy. And at, at UCSF, we did a little bit of, of, of work on that with Shelley, Dr. Shelley Wong, who's right. now at Duke University, looking at DCIS being core biopsied and then going on uh, either letrozole um, or tamoxifen sure. and following them for six months right. to 12 months and then going on. Yeah, to Shelley's been a real pioneer of this, right. hasn't she? Absolutely. In other words, do like we do in the uh, NSABP prevention trials, right. make the diagnosis but say, hey, right. let's go. And, and, and any outcome from her work so far? So her, you know? Yeah, her original work in the kind of the window trial that she did, there were a, a very uh, significant number of women that the DCIS either went away or had a very minimal amount of DCIS left when they went back to surgery. So okay. now having a more objective way of identifying the true risk of those patients, we envision at UCSF actually doing that trial exactly um, and doing the core biopsy, identifying such a low risk yep. that we see them very yep. similar yep. to what we do when we biopsy atypia or LCIS. Now in retrospect, because you still have the cores around from Shelley's work at UCSF. Right. Have you gone back and looked at the Oncotype score yeah. on any of those? We, we haven't done that, but we've, we've discussed potentially sending those off just to kind of see what the, the connection between, for example, the MRI findings, because all these women got MRIs. Yep. So we'll see if there was some MRI findings consistent with the score and the treatment, or even also identifying uh, maybe a tamoxifen sensitivity or a hormone sensitivity DCIS relationship as well, which which could be huge not only in this oh, group of patients but in any yeah, type of yeah, patient. Yeah, exactly right. right. Well, listen. In the last couple of minutes we have, I'd like to have you put on your other hat, and then we'll do an overall summary of your DCIS stuff. Todd's already waved. I, I get all of his body language <laughs> over there. What, I, all I got to do is watch him move, and I know what he wants me to do. But before we do the summary of your paper and everything. Sure. For those who may have tuned in later on, tell me a little bit. I believe either today or tomorrow there's going to be an update on the target trial presented right. here, and I know you're involved with that. <laughs> yeah. You know, right? And uh, so anything I don't know if that's embargoed or not. Yeah, that's, any that, words on so that? that is that is embargoed. But there, uh, there's uh, presenting data this afternoon on a total of 3,400 patients. Okay, um, about. 2,000 of those patients have four-year follow-up and a little over 1,000 have five-year follow-up. Okay. It is the largest randomized partial breast trial out there. Right. And right. I think the data looks very strong. And okay. um, I'll just say we'll be continuing to use the intraoperative radiation therapy okay. uh, after today okay. as well. So. How do we best sum up what you've just shared with our medical colleagues as far as your presentation here, what's sort of the take-home message uh, right. from your presentation? So as I was saying earlier, after modeling those two scenarios, either 
clin standard clinical pathologic features where 75% of women get radiation or utilizing the assay where only 25% of women actually get radiation. What we found is that even though we utilize the cost of the, the Oncotype assay, yep. it saves about $1,000 per patient. Wow. And the difference in quality of life, whether you add radiation or not, is almost equivalent. Um, but you save two-thirds of women from having to undergo five to six weeks of radiation. So with regards to cost effectiveness, not only with regards to quality of life, but also as a societal perspective, uh, I think it's, it's huge. Okay. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Hey, Michael, <laughs> as always, great to see you. Thank you very much. Congratulations on the fabulous work you're doing. Thank you very much.